as well. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sterling, and I will hand it over to you. Okay, um, I guess I'm coming through. Um, thank you. Uh, gee, that, that's a, a wonderful club and lots of exciting activities, wonderful images, so it sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, congratulations on that. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, so, um, yeah, that's uh, basically the uh, story. Um, I did work, actually, I did work with George. Uh, that's something that might be of interest to you. He was my, um, uh, I guess initially he was my supervisor's supervisor uh, when I was doing a postdoc way back when. And uh, then uh, when I was there at uh, NRL, um, uh, so that was the, uh, the uh, late 80s, when I was there uh, working for uh, George's uh, worker, basically, uh, George, and then I got a postdoc position in Japan that was going to follow on. So anyway, George told me that, uh, well, they have this uh, project that they're working on and it's going to require someone to uh, be in Japan um, to, to babysit this instrument on a satellite. And um, uh, basically after I did a couple of years in Kyoto, I came back to NRL for a half a year to learn a little bit about uh, that instrument. And then I went there and I spent, oh, um, I guess that was an eight year stint in Japan working for NRL. And um, then uh, uh, I, I have to think about the whole actual path. But anyway, in some, I spent oh, uh, about 17 years out of uh, 25 total in, in Japan. And um, some of that was working for NRL and some of that was working for NASA Marshall, where I'm at now. Uh, so anyway. Um, Alphonse uh, yes. fluent Japanese. So he was very, very useful there. Yes, that was probably uh, my largest contribution at that uh, during those days when we had visitors coming over, I could uh, take them to dinner and order for them. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, yes, uh, I got at some point into uh, uh, eclipses and eclipse photography. So as a kid, I was, you know, an amateur astronomer, but um, um, probably like a lot of us, you know, uh, after high school, I got into college and, you know, you're trying to get through college and then you're trying to get through grad school and do a career. And then um, actually I thought, well, you know, it might be kind of fun to uh, go back into astronomy, amateur astronomy, um, but I thought I would start with eclipses and I don't know if that was a good idea or not. But anyway, let's uh, get going a little bit. Um, so anyway, uh, I you know this, I know, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, what's special about solar eclipse? Of course, uh, the lowest atmosphere of the sun is the photosphere, and um, uh, it's, um, you know, that's what you normally see, and above that's the chromosphere, this red bit there, and the corona, of course which is what we all uh, uh, do. I, I don't know if there are any very uh, uh, novice folks there, but of course what an eclipse is, is basically when one body falls into the shadow of another, I guess, uh, astronomical body. So of course for a solar eclipse, the moon comes between the earth and the sun and the, earth, the moon shadow falls onto the earth. And you got to get under the um, um, shadow. So anyway, uh, it's uh, essential, of course, that one, if they're talking about the sun, you know, you obviously you have to watch your eye safety. And, um, um, you know, as a professional, when you're kind of, uh, you know, you're under time pressure with the eclipse coming up and it's your only time, your only opportunity in, in two years or 15 years or something, uh, you can do some quite silly things, actually. So. All I can say is uh, just uh, keep in mind your your eye safety, and of course, uh, for novices, uh, you can only directly view it during totality only. 
So it's a unique opportunity to get photographs of it. <laughs> As I'm going to talk about, uh, you might want to be sure that you want to do it. And uh, so I can give a couple of experiences from the uh, front line of past eclipses. And actually, uh, this is my eclipse history. Uh, my first one when I was when I was in college, and uh, it was in LA and at Caltech. And uh, uh, there is one that went through, the, started in the north part of the U.S., northwest U.S. So we ended up going to Walla Walla, Washington. And if uh, nothing else, uh, it's a, it's fun to say. Uh, we saw it through thin clouds there. Uh, we flew up to San Francisco with um, with uh, a couple of my buddies, or two or three of my buddies, and we met another one who was taking a year off and at Stanford that year or something. And then we drove from there. So uh, that was great fun. And uh, you know, you're driving around at rapid speed in the last moments, trying desperately to find a clear spot. And uh, as they say, we saw it only through thin clouds. And you know, that's kind of interesting though, because we couldn't really see the corona then. Uh, uh, we could see the chromosphere for sure, but, but the clouds are so thin that you just couldn't see the corona. But what uh, I realized that you could see is you could actually see the umbra on the thin clouds. So you could see the umbra approaching the uh, limb of the sun, and that when the uh, umbra crossed the sun, that defined totality. You know, and um, uh, you could see that edge, that um, diffuse edge of the uh, umbra uh, approaching, and uh, like when it would pass Venus. Now Venus, of course, that close to totality is still is already visible, but uh, Venus and other and bright stars. Once that umbra, uh, uh, you know, not sharp but uh, a little diffuse umbra crosses the um, uh, crosses Venus, it, it just snaps into uh, prominence. So it, it was really quite dramatic. It, it's hard to get away from eclipses being dramatic. But uh, then in 1998, I was in the island of Guadeloupe. We actually had a conference there. Um, and uh, that is uh, French territory in, um, uh, in the Caribbean. Um, and that was the first time I saw uh, um, the corona, actually. And uh, actually, I was quoted by a Japanese journalist whom I had met there on the island, and she wrote this article in uh, the Asahi uh, uh, Shinbun, and he's saying there that uh, something like, oh, this guy, you know, he's usually uh, you know, like this I know, crazy American working in Japan or something, and usually is speaking lots of Japanese. But then during the uh, eclipse, all he could say is, oh, my God, oh, my God. And it was really true because I hadn't seen the eclipse, the, the corona in 79. So uh, that was, I was just so blown away by actually seeing it. And then you're thinking, well, it's so bright. How come you can't see it all the time? And um, uh, of course, it ends. And oh, yeah, you can't see it all the time. So then in 99, I uh, went to Romania, which was like 10 years after the fall of the wall. And so that's a whole side story. But uh, uh, anyway, I saw it there. And then, um, then I did several others, some of which I'll talk about. But the next one in 2006, I'm going to talk about next. And that one was in Ghana in West Africa. And uh, what had happened was, you know, I'd seen three of them, and I had starting a career as a solar physicist, um, you know, quite well into it by then. And so I said, well, you know, I've seen these, and I gawked at them for three times now. Well, that's kind of enough. You know, let's, let's try and do something with this, you know, at least get some pictures or something. Uh, and... Um, so I have to say that uh, this Romania, Romanian eclipse in 99, <laughs> that, is, uh, that is the last uh, 
total solar eclipse I have enjoyed. <laughs> so uh, exercise caution and, and uh, things are changing and you don't have to do it kind of at the same intensity level as I've been trying to, but uh, it's something to keep in mind. Um, so anyway, uh, let's go to uh, Ghana, West Africa in uh, 2006. And um, I'm titling this How Not to Do Eclipse Photography. Now, um, I am at NASA and so, um, uh, uh, you know, so of course this is a public job and I understand the rules, but NASA has these strict rules. So I can't show people, uh, you know, without getting their permission or something. So um, before when I was talking on this part, before uh, NASA got wise to how free the internet, you know, free and what, you know, wild, willing, you know, and wild west like the, the internet is, you know, it was letting do so. So at this time, I had several wonderful pictures of folks in the, I was with and in, in the area, but um, I couldn't find any now without folks. So this is why the next one is um, going to have some uh, pictures here. And in fact, I think, um, I think I'm going to use the height of uh, hubris here, uh, Paul, because we've had such success in getting this uh, share screen going that I have the hubris to say that I think confident I can get it going again. But anyway, I have to tell talk about it. So I, I'll talk about it a little bit before going back to the slide. So this is Ghana in 2006. And actually, I uh, was fortunate I got some money to bring some students so i had a couple of uh, students with me um um there and uh, i had some equipment there to do some uh, photographs which you'll see in a, a little bit um and uh, so i set this up and it was a three minute eclipse or so and so i um uh you know i had this plan of attacking everything um you know i would I would observe for 90 seconds, so three minutes, and so for 90 seconds, oh, at this time, of course, there wasn't this automatic software and everything, so I was going to manually change the exposures and take pictures. So I was going to have one student read the num the uh, exposure uh, settings to me uh, sequentially, and uh, I would take the pictures, and then halfway through, I was going to have them switch and have the other student do it. That was so that one, you know, each of the students would have uh, 90 seconds to enjoy the uh, eclipse unencumbered. So anyway, uh, we set up in one part of the uh, university, uh, Cape Coast University, and uh, it, it's really amazing. You probably won't have this in the U.S., but uh, you can get it overseas uh, in developing nations a lot. But I set up. And like immediately, this crowd of folks, good folks, just crowds around because it becomes a center of attention, and they stand incredibly close. I mean, it's because they, you know, they want to see and everything. So this was an issue, but also it started clouding up as we were setting up there, uh, because around totality, this is in the tropics, right? And so the temperature is cooling. Um, uh, and, um, oh, I, I assume you can see me. So yeah, right. So it started clouding up and everything. So we were thinking, well, what to do? And we decided, okay, well, we would go to the coast because we had some thoughts that it might be clearer at the coast. And, um, so we were packing up and as you know, if you travel to developing nations or to a lot of nations, you know, you often bargain with things and you do with like the taxi drivers there. So uh, usually, you know, you're bargaining to go someplace for like a couple of bucks or something was equivalent to like a couple of dollars. So this time we had our equipment and everything and we're saying, you know, the, the driver starts, starts off at $10, expecting us to drop down to something. And we say, okay, and so he was very happy 
And he probably didn't realize that if he had said $50, we would have said, okay. So anyway, we get over there at the beach and we set up. And I had this new mount, I think it was an Orion mount, real advanced at that time. And uh, uh, I started trying to find the sun. And I had practiced this many times. You can use the shadow to find the sun. Uh, there's no go-to or anything. So I'm trying to do that. Well, the partial phases are well advanced. And so uh, the shadow is getting dim. So uh, it's getting bloody difficult to find, um, you, you know, to get the alignment done. So one of the two students I remember calmly saying to me, um, uh, it's two minutes to totality. I just want you to know that. And I'm still calmly looking. I can't say calmly, but I'm looking for the uh, sun. And uh, actually, I get it in the field of view. And I get it there. And then for about three seconds, and the crowd had, grouted, had gathered around too at this time. So there are students and, uh, and a crowd of folks all waiting for me to find the sun. And so I find it. And um, for like two seconds, I thought, wow, I'm the only one who knows I'm looking at the sun. And so uh, then I tell everyone and everyone's relieved. And uh, then we start our program. And for the first 90 seconds, we're going uh, and we're taking photographs and things are really going along swimmingly. Then at 90 seconds, when the students switched, at that time, I was going to refocus. So I go back to the eyepiece and I look and I, I refocus then. And so I look through the uh, scope or the, uh, the eyepiece of the camera. <laughs> there's no sun there. There's, there's no sun in the field of view. So um, again, very calmly. <laughs> I don't know about that. I start to look for the sun and I'm moving the scope around and um, then I uh, get it in a part of the field of view. And uh, then I'm thinking, okay, it's partly in the field of view. And I said, okay, now just center it. And then I did the one wise thing that I did during this uh, whole adventure. I said, you know, a fraction of a second later, I said, no, you fool take pictures, take pictures. So I took one picture and then the students are exclaiming, the diamond ring, oh, it's so beautiful. Which of course meant the eclipse was over and I had uh, my one shot. So, um, or I didn't know what I had, but anyway, um, so then the uh, students are there and um, um, uh, the students are talking with some of the local people, and one of the students who was quite facile actually with normal cameras, she had a small camera or maybe an early phone camera, I don't remember, and she's showing the folks, and she's saying to these uh, folks, oh yeah, you think mine are nice with this little camera, wait till you see Alphonse's. And then for like two seconds, I was the only one, I was the only one who knew that I got absolutely nothing. So uh, that was uh, that experience. And then um, uh, now, okay, let me do, again, this is hubris, just like during the eclipse. I'm going to go back and try and find my screen and get it going again. Um, and if that is up, then, um, Okay, I saw there was a question, but let me uh, just go on uh, for a couple of more uh, minutes here. So um, this is my single photograph from that uh, Ghanaian eclipse. Uh, this is the one. And there were two students there. Uh, one of them, uh, Samaya Farid is her name. She actually uh, got her master's and she very generously put this pho photograph in her master's thesis. The other student, the one who was facile with the, the camera, uh, cameras to, you know, 
her own. She um, basically never spoke to me again. <laughs> so so uh, that was my uh, Ghanaian uh, experience. Um, I think I will do the lessons learned and then we can do the question. So among the lessons learned, the mount I had was a new mount. So what actually happened was I did not uh, lock the uh, the um, polar axis well just because I, I wasn't used to using it. As George will tell you, and a lot of physicists will tell you, don't, a lot of physicists who do lab work will tell you, do not go to the field with new equipment. Make sure you know what you're doing with it. So I uh, now I make sure I'm very familiar with it. So, uh, and then the other thing is cons consider carefully before moving because that uh, was also a very uh, a dangerous thing because, um, um, you know, you have to kind of make your setup and then you have to do it. Then practice, practice, practice. I think we can go to that question if there is one. Yeah, Paul Jacobs, did you have a question or um, just maybe we just want to put it in chat? Yeah, maybe we just press then um, Alphonse and pick up. Okay, all right, let's go on. Um, I don't even remember what's next. Let's see. Okay, Gansu Province in China, 2008. So this is a year and a half later. For a year and a half later, I, I I just couldn't get this off my mind. This haunted me. It just haunted me. Uh, this uh, eclipse adventure in uh, Ghana just haunted me to no end. You know, nightmares about it, everything. So anyway, uh, I went to uh, uh, this eclipse. I did find a photograph. My colleague, uh, uh, oops. My colleague, um, Antonio Savcheva, is there off to the side, whom George may know, and of course I can't show her. But anyway, she's there. There I am in action. This is the northwest of China, so it's a desert area um, near the historical city of Dunhuang on the Silk Road, if you ever get the chance to, to visit. The camera you see there is the one I had also in Ghana, and the setup is I, basically the same. So I have a Canon that's a early Canon, Canon Digital Rebel, and it's a uh, telephoto lens. Uh, I think I had it at uh, like uh, f 400 at that time, if I recall, uh, 200, I guess, and then a doubler to make it 400. So it's there on the uh, equatorial mount. So uh, this time I said, oh, yeah, right. I'm not going to do this experience. Oh, so what I figured out what happened also in Ghana. What happened was, uh, all right, so I was standing, I was, I was kneeling as um, our good friend with the uh, six-inch Tinsley refractor was saying, you know, I was you know, like a foot down off the ground looking along the side of this during the eclipse in Ghana. And then so I was in back of the camera looking, you know, out at toward the eclipse. And my plan was to look at the back of the camera there to see the image and to make sure I was looking at the image. And when I was taking the photos, I now realize that what I was doing was I was looking along the uh, lens at the real sun. So I was thinking I was really taking the pictures instead of, um, uh, you know, I wasn't looking at the back of the screen as per my plan. So I realized that I said, okay, all right, here we are at this eclipse once every whatever. I, I do not want to see this bloody eclipse. I don't want to see it. I, I turned my back to the eclipse and I looked only at the back of the um the camera i, I didn't want to see it i wanted the picture nothing else so um 
uh, anyway, I, uh, you know, the partial phase is there, got that. And now I'm going to do an interlude because Paul had told me that I should say something just about doing partial eclipses and also the angular eclipse. Uh, so photographing partial eclipses. And now this is based on DSLR photography. Uh, and, you know, there are new um, cameras out there, telephone, and I have no idea of how to do it with that. So I, I can't speak to that. But uh, anyway, uh, of course, um, as you will realize, a solar filter is essential, you know, uh, during the angular eclipse also, it'll be essential. But the thing is, they're comparatively easy because there's no, or I should say, well, for partial, it's no, you know, vastly reduced time pressure or no time pressure. And the angular, you know, can be five minutes or something. So uh, that is a big advantage. And also it's easy to practice beforehand. And because that the reason is because you can do it any sunny day. Basically it's to just, you know, the because you're seeing the photosphere during the partial phases or angular phases, it's the same, um, you know, protection wise as, uh, as doing a, um, uh, you know, the uh, uneclipsed sun. So just any sunny day, just go out and do it. The procedures and the exposures are basically the same as, you know, for during that eclipse as an eclipse. So just do that. And that allows you to do all sorts of tests with uh, trying different focal lengths, lenses, uh, you know, to get the sizes right and everything. So that's, that's what I would say about that. There'll be a caveat coming up. Uh, but uh, we'll get to that. So anyway, back to uh, Gansu province. So here we are at the partial face that worked. And uh, this time, <laughs> forget looking at this thing. I'm just taking this picture. And I'm looking at the back of the camera, but I got it. And I, I got this thing. So uh, there it is. I'm quite happy with these. Now I'm doing different exposures. I'm going through a whole sequence of them. And uh, during the longest exposures, I forgot what they were. The, the longest ones were actually washed out. But during those, I did sneak a peek back at the real sun. So I did actually look at it for a few seconds. But um, uh, that's what went on. This, of course, is the, um, uh, the diamond ring. So I was... Uh, uh, I'd say ecstatic about that. And uh, this is a combined, um, um, uh, you know, image of it using the, the various exposures. I think I have a dark disc covering the moon, um, probably to cover blemishes, but I'm quite happy with this. You can see here, this is a prominence. I'll show another prominence later. Um, but anyway, you can also see the corona has like this loop-like structure above it. These are actually coronal cavities. Um, there are particular regions in the magnetic field of the sun that hold these uh, prominence, prominences. So uh, I was, uh, I finally, I was freed from Ghana after this. So uh, I, I uh, was very happy uh, with this. I will say now another uh, uh, point here, uh, you know, obviously I did the stacking here. And um, uh, again, probably because of NASA rules, I don't want to be too specific here, but I would say that uh, I think this is the actual website, but if not, you can do the uh, Sky and Telescope, uh, you know, uh, totality, uh, HDR, just kind of Google that enough and you can find it. The thing is Sky and Telescope has been doing this for uh, a long time. And so the one that is here at this particular article is a newer version, uh, but the one I used to back in the 08 time was, um, you know, that may have been uh, put on by Espanac or somebody. Um, uh, but anyway, the procedure, is basically uh, unchanged with what they have now with what I did with the one I just showed you. And and if you're familiar with the, um, uh, what's it called? Un unsharp masking, uh, sharpening procedure in Photoshop or something. Basically, that's what you're doing. It's if you're doing it manually, you're, you're like 
taking your image, you know, each image you kind of copy it several times and you kind of defocus one by rotating it slightly and then and then you kind of subtract that off of the other one and that gives that like sharpens up the edges and um then you combine it you know there are details there i couldn't remember the details anyway but uh you know all of that is laid out in in these articles um okay uh now another kind of uh interlude sort of thing just a little bit of uh i mean i think you folks know this stuff anyway but um you know the the corona though uh is of course uh, uh you know special and and hot you know it's expected though to be cold because if you look at the sun i mean you know it's we have sorted out that the interior of the interior of the sun i'm talking about we you know solar physicists collectively over centuries you know, it's sorted out that the interior of the sun is hot but then the surface of the sun, the temperatures dropped down and it's quite cold. Well, I mean, you know, we know now it's like 6,000 Kelvin, which is about 6,000 Celsius, you know. So, uh, you know, it's, it's quite cool. So you expect it to keep on dropping down. Well, uh, they uh, found some strange spectral lines uh, during an eclipse uh, in 1869. And uh, this is sort of the image that they uh, actually saw. Uh, this is actually one I took in the uh, 17 eclipse, the 2017, not 1817, mind you, uh, or not even 19, or not, I mean, or even 1917. Uh, but uh, this is um, now what this is. Just uh, uh, again, uh, many of you folks are familiar with this. Um, or newer or less experienced folks, so maybe not. But anyway, just a spectrograph, a normal spectrograph, uh, you know, it breaks light up into its component uh, parts or colors, if you will. And, uh, you know, you can do this if you have a prism. You know, if you have a prism back here, you can actually make one of these quite easily. You have to pick up some diffraction gratings, which you can get from hobby shops or, you know, you know, Amazon is where you go for everything now, I guess. Anyway, uh, you just this can be just like a um, we call paper towel roll, and you you have a slit in front. So uh, you can make a toy one just by putting some aluminum foil over a um, a uh, a uh, paper towel uh, central roll, and just using a razor blade to cut a uh, slit in the front, and then in the back you use this diffraction grating thing which is uh, basically it's like uh, uh, glass or plastic in this case with a lot of thin parallel lines here and just by running parallel and very close it's uh, so close that the light going through here uh, you know the the wave of the light you know the wave uh, fronts of the light coming off here kind of interact with each other in such a way that uh, 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 it, it spreads it out into its component parts like a, uh, like a prism does um, uh, through an interference and diffraction uh, effect. Anyway, you do that and you can get like uh, basically an image of the slit that is spread out into a uh, spectrum. And so uh, these spectra are really nice because uh, uh, again, as most of you know, different elements produce different uh, patterns of spectral lines in the spectrum. So these are like fingerprints for the elements. So like, like hydrogen has a strong line here in the red and then has some other lines down, you know, in the other part of the visible spectrum. And sodium has another distinctive pattern and basically any uh, element does. So these uh, spectra can be used to um, to observe, you know, what's in things and uh you know uh, people had done this on earth and they look you know heat up some object a little bit and then they get their spectra oh that's what hydrogen looks like sodium that's what carbon looks like all this stuff so they so during eclipses you can do the same thing but uh, remember just at the start of totality or just before the sun 
is, you know, it's, it's a very narrow, narrow sliver of light, of bright light. Well, you can use that instead of the slit, and you don't need a slit. You just have this open, and it's just going through a diffraction grating, and then you put a, a camera back here. Um, so that's basically what I did in the 17 Eclipse, and uh, you can get these spectral lines, and then you can identify them. And uh, this is uh, these are all hydrogen lines here. This is the hydrogen alpha line, which everyone there are most of you are familiar with and love uh, at 65, 63 uh, angstroms. Um, and this one here is actually for helium. And this here is a funny one. And uh, this one, people didn't know what to do with in this 1869 eclipse. And uh, now it's identified, but then it wasn't. So, uh, all of these, so you're getting this fingerprint of something that you didn't recognize. And so people said, okay, well, you know, we're seeing this coming from the corona. So let's just call it, a, it's a, it must be a new element since we don't recognize it. Let's call it coronium. Okay, so coronium's there. And uh, so this um, uh, idea went along. And um, the problem was, these pesky chemists who are around. They just, I mean, there was this perfectly good idea for the, what this was and a nice discovery of a spectral line by the good guys. You know, the solar physicist had done this wonderful work. Physicists and astronomers done this wonderful work and discovered a new element. And these pesky chemists come along and say, hey, we have this thing called the periodic table and your coronium business won't fit on it it just won't work and actually this went on for uh, a long time it was uh, not until 1940 so this is like 70 years later it was found that actually this was not a new thing it was just something from a very hot uh one one element that uh you know iron in this case it was iron it was the iron spectral lines but made when iron is raised to extremely high temperatures, like a million degrees. And uh, when you do that, you get a fingerprint pattern much different from what you had before. But this was figured out in about 1940, and then it was realized, oh, the corona is hot. So one big mystery was solved after 70 years, and it caused another huge headache that's still going on today. Why is the corona so bloody hot? Um, now, you know, there's one thing about this. Okay, you know, now chemist or something or somebody might gloat and say, oh, well, you know, these not so astronomers or physicists thought they had some new element. But actually, as I say right here, this is helium. This was found in uh, an eclipse, uh, one or, or maybe from the ground, uh, non-eclipse time, but anyway, it was identified a couple of years earlier because the spectroscope had just been discovered around this time. And this had been seen, this yellow line had been seen in the sun uh, at that time. This line was not known on Earth at the, that time. And so uh, people saw this spectral line and they said, well, this must come from the sun and we're, uh, we're seeing it in the sun. So let's call it uh, helium for helios. Uh, the, from the Greek word helios for the sun. So actually, um, just a few years later, and then it wasn't until several years later when people really discovered helium on Earth also. So the point is, um, there really was something discovered, a new element was discovered in the sun. Um, and so this idea of coronium wasn't so nutty actually after all i mean it was a reasonable um you know hypothesis uh and and it worked for a different element and maybe that's saving face for my uh colleagues going back decades but anyway uh that's the situation so as now the situation is this the photosphere is about uh, six thousand kelvin uh the chromosphere this uh, red part here is about ten thousand degrees and uh, 
and it's very red and its name comes also from Greek words, chromos for color and sphere for sphere. And uh, uh, this red color comes because the because of the H alpha, the hydrogen alpha transition in, in hydrogen. Um, you know, it's some transition in the hydrogen atom. And it just, the conditions in the chromosphere are just, uh, just right on target for making that transition in the hydrogen very favorable. So that's really the dominant line there. So this is why it has this wonderful red glow. And the, the corona uh, is one to three million K. And then, um, the things that George was specializing in uh, and was actually finding was that there are flares that have temperatures of 20 and 30 million degrees. But I'll let you talk about, let him talk about that at some point. So anyway, all of this is basically due to the magnetism and that's key to why the corona is uh, hot and uh, basically responsible for many, if not almost all of the changing features of the sun. Um, and you can actually see this effect if you take my picture there uh, from the uh, from Gansu province and you see the corona there. Well, you can put a big magnet in there and you can see the poles here, the North Pole here. This flowers out like this and it flowers out in the south also. And then on the sides, it's, tr it's trying to do this. But it's interrupted because there are these big, strong, uh, uh, like minor magnets, smaller size magnets that kind of disrupt the, the general structure. And it makes things like these cavities I talked about, like these, these circular things here. This is basically where if you were looking at this part of it, you would see uh, uh, strong sunspots in this, this region. But anyhow, this is the magnetic structure of the uh, sun that's being, um, uh, displayed with the the eclipse structure and we can learn about the corona the magnetic field of the sun from eclipses too okay the the magnetic field actually and it's important was really uh, brought to fruition uh by this fellow called uh, george ellery hale hale back in uh, 1908 and i don't know if he discovered or confirmed it but anyway he used a spectroscope and looked at sunspots and found that they have a really strong magnetic field. So this is kind of uh, like a the birth of solar astrophysics, really. So Hale, we uh, honor, we respect uh, so much for this that uh, our American Astronomical Society um, Solar Physics Division established the GE Hale Prize in 1978. This prize is awarded annually to only one person, and it's uh, the quote is for outstanding contributions over an extended period of time to the field of solar astronomy. So it's by far the uh, most uh, prestigious uh, prize in um, in our solar physics um, community. And the 2015 Hale Prize winner was uh, your own George A. Doshak, actually. So uh, he's uh, quite a uh, resource you have right there. OK, uh, back to um, other things, um, more pictures. OK, now this is really apropos for next month. In 2012, there was an angular eclipse in Tokyo. So. Um, this is it. Uh, fortunately, my uh, colleagues here have their backs turned so I can get their picture. But this is actually the setup I was using for this eclipse, and I also used it for uh, 17. Uh, this is a uh, Tagashi FSQ 106 ED. Um, and uh, this is a Tagashi mount. Um, and uh, Let's see, this of course is a um, solar filter, probably a thousand notes, I think. And uh, I, a Canon camera, I've forgotten if it's the same one as I used before. This is actually something that uh, another lesson learned from Ghana. 
this is a finder. Now, usually with finders, you uh, you know, a good practice for solar viewing is just take them off. But I learned, as I said, is it can be hard to find the sun. Um, um, you know, if you're just trying to find it, you know, manually. And uh, I found it can be extremely helpful to use the finder, uh, as you can imagine. And so I uh, found a nice, uh, you know, I arranged a nice quick slip uh, filter for that too. And that was a big assistance in, uh, in getting the, uh, um, you know, finding the sun. Okay, so uh, that's that situation. Um, so how about the angular eclipse? Okay, everything's there. And so this is um, the picture of it. So here we are. This is showing another issue with the eclipses. Clouds. So uh, there were clouds and they weren't, it wasn't totally uh, covered, but it was almost socked out uh, until uh, angularity. Uh, commenced and actually we missed the start of it or else I got pictures of it and it was too cloudy but then the sun started to uh, come out now uh, George has a story about this uh, from an eclipse in Hawaii I've forgotten the year and uh, many people do the uh, sun and it's kind of opposite Hana actually but uh, it seems like those, these holes open up in the clouds, uh, and that's not an, an. There can be, I would say, that there can be cloud changes, aren't unusual, and I'm sure it's due to the rapidly changing temperature at the time of totality. So in Ghana and the tropics, it was making clouds, and here it was thinning the clouds out. And so during the angularity, the uh, sun became visible. And I started to take pictures, but I found with my solar filter, like you're supposed to have on, I couldn't, I couldn't get anything at all, bloody nothing. So I said, huh, let's just take it off and see what happens and just get the exposures really down low. And so I did that and I made them uh, very short exposures and I was varying the exposures and uh, so I got the exposure about right in, in uh, this one. And it's varying because you can see here it's brighter than here. So it was varying during it. So uh, here's another one, a little longer in it. Uh, but then it got, the clouds got so thin that the sun was getting too bright. So I had to throw the filter on and I had to increase the exposure time. And so uh, that's what's going on here. And I have several of uh, it ending. And if you look here, you can see at the edges, there, there are clouds there. But now, without the filter, it would be blinding. So um, this shows actually another issue with um, the more lessons learned. You know, you're doing photography, that's what you're set on. Well, there you are. What is it? You've done it. All your practices are nice, clear skies because if it's cloudy, you aren't nutty enough to go out and do it. If it's cloudy, where are you going to do it? Well, the eclipse state doesn't know that. So, uh, you know, this is another thing you have to deal with. You're going to have clouds. So, what are you going to do then? So, in this case, since this is my uh, whole objective, you know, I, I'm you know, I was going to do something. So again, I'm not there enjoying it, the eclipse. No, I'm trying to figure out, well, what exposures am I going to do? I have five minutes and time is ticking. So I had to be adaptable. And also I had to have a backup plan. I can't remember if I knew that then or decided then. <laughs> and again, you got to bloody practice, practice, practice. So again, it's an all consuming thing. That's everything. And so uh, there you are doing it. And uh, what are you going to do now that it's partially cloudy, which you didn't plan on? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I even thought beforehand I'd take the, the uh, filter off. Maybe when it was cloudy. But anyway, all right. So off to another one. This is uh, Mangaya. 
Cook Islands. Cook Islands are in the South Pacific, uh, and they still bloody can't sort out whether this is an independent country or if it's part of New Zealand. And actually, I think it it's not recognized as the UN as a independent nation, but sort of like is like a property of New Zealand, but New Zealand kind of recognizes as an independence. Whatever. Anyway, they're nice islands, but it's on a uh this mangaya is really remote Rar Rarotonga is the capital of the cook islands and it's the main island and uh so there it's uh, still uh some uh, elements of uh things you're used to in strong population centers but uh, mangaya it's not but basically, uh, the folks there kind of rented out, you know, all the hotels. There was some expat there who uh, got wind of this and and sort of set up all of these rental places. And myself and my team had a um, had like a, a rental house, and um, uh, it was like a mile away from the main uh, place where we all met. But basically, this fellow arranged uh, to have a lot of local folks rent out places or rent out rooms. And so it, it was really, I think, a great success for them. We had a great time. And again, I'm kind of sorry we didn't. Um, so this is uh, me having arrived at uh, the uh, airport. And this plane was... Uh, plane ride going from Rarotonga to Magaya was uh, was fascinating too. I mean, it's a very small plane and, uh, you know, the uh, cockpit door is open and you can kind of, you can, it's not like having a camera look at the runway. You're looking at the runway through the cockpit window as you're approaching it, oscillating with quite large amplitude vibrations as you're approaching the runway and uh, bouncing as you're landing. But anyway, you get there and uh, this is the welcome center. Uh, this was, uh, this this fellow had arranged all of, uh, you know, as I said, the um, in the housing and uh, it was great, you know, this main folks there or, or something you know would, would arrange for breakfast for for food for all of us wonderful meals uh and this crew that we had there there was uh you know uh about uh, two or three dozen of us there and we actually have a um a uh, an email group and we still contact around eclipse times uh to the group to see who's going where and if you want to try and work things. And obviously these are backpacker people and everything. So you can get a lot of hints. You know, I kind of have a different agenda, so I haven't put uh, that much with them, but uh, that's still done. And so it's an incredible uh, you know, kind of experience. So here we are. So we set up at the uh, airport where the main kind of uh, groups were, and then other folks set up at other parts of the island. Um, and here we are. And before totality, it's uh, cloudy here. That's why it's blurry. This is through clouds, and this is through clouds. And actually, it was clear before totality. Uh, no, I, I don't mean clear. It was this much clear before totality. I forgot. It was like two minutes before. This is what we could see, and about three minutes after, we could see it again. During totality, we were completely so socked out. So, uh, but again, you know, I wasn't, um, I wasn't going to move because I had learned <laughs> that you weren't going to try and chase it, you know, because you have all this equipment set up and it's way too sophisticated at this point to try and move. So I don't do that. So I just took these pictures and, you know, this is what you, you get. And uh, so that was uh, Mangaya. <laughs> I have to tell you. So we, as I said, we set up at this location at the airport. Um, and other folks are at other places. <laughs> so we were at the airport and socked out during totality. 
but everyone else on the at other parts of the island you know down at the other end some you know few 10 kilometers away and at the other side of the island all of them all of them saw saw totality it was only us so this is what you live with you know if you're just going to look at it well you say i'm not staying here with these losers because it's going to be cloudy i'm going to go to the other side with these other people but you have your equipment there and so this is what you're you're wedded to okay uh let's go to 17. many of you saw this um i was in Louisville, idaho uh and this is where we were i had a colleague who actually had uh uh so this time in japan there were three people working this is before then i guess and working in japan from nasa there was me doing my thing with uh, a satellite project there's a fellow who is at the embassy in downtown then there's another fellow who um was working with the astronauts for the japanese uh uh person to space program and also the uh, japanese module so anyway this um this guy uh worked at the astronauts he retired but he found he had some uh obscure relatives of his in the middle of the path of totality uh, for this so he, guess what he made contact with them and they had this wonderful huge farm so it was great we had uh, kind of like took over the place our scope off to the right there's my uh uh buddy cal siemens and uh the uh two uh green takahashi mounted items are mine or my equipment and then the rest are kids and other folks all set up looking in one direction obviously um and here i am uh doing some tests and what I am doing now is I am, by this time, I found this uh, software that uh, will actually work with uh, Canon cameras and I'm sure other cameras too. Um, I, well, I don't know, I don't wanna say, because uh, if it says Nikon, forget it, I'm out of there. I mean, it's Canon, all right, we're in business. And I know a couple of folks on, we're talking about Nikon, so there you go but I'm sure there's something. Um, anyhow, set this up and it's great because you can program uh, based on the uh, eclipse statistics for where you're at to do the timing uh, during the eclipse. Uh, so I was working that software and doing tests. And this is another thing that you'll find out you'll need if you're gonna use this computer, a sunshade. So uh, this is, probably a lesson learned from I don't know what experience, but uh, this is what you find out. And this is the uh, fellow, Xavier Jupiter is the fellow's name, and Solar Eclipse Maestro is his Eclipse software. Uh, again, you can see for yourself, Google yourself uh, the uh, details. So uh, this is, uh, uh, again, the partial phases, wonderful and uh the um uh, diamond ring and uh totality different exposures here's a prominence that i got here's a, a close-up of that uh, prominence you see a nice uh hint of this cavity there and like this uh, dark area around it some of the details in it um more exposures and uh and this is my final composite from it uh and so um, um i'm quite happy with uh with this one okay uh so now i can say my eclipse history going back to this these uh, first three i got that ghana i don't want to think about anymore uh, China, you saw the success uh, I had. The second China one in 2009, I mean, 
I mean, there are issues with this too. I mean, there are folks around, and um, uh, I think, I think now that we were kind of subject to some uh, comedy program on Chinese TV or something, because there was some guy jumping around during totality, saying things uh, uh, to us like, "Well, he came up to me and said in Chinese, he said." Oh, it's really beautiful. I'm Kellyong, he says. And I just said, get out of here. <laughs> because I tried to take my uh, photograph. So I think it was probably some comedy TV program where they said, well, there are going to be all these uh, foreign people there doing all this serious stuff. So let's go and have some fun. So you don't know what you're going to get. OK, Cook Islands, I said that, cloudy, angular. Good shots, but through clouds. Australia, poor shots through clouds. Indonesia, it was hazy, but okay. I like the chromosphere. I was really happy with Idaho. And Chile, oh, in 2019. This was a story too. So I'm back here with uh, this software again. Fine. Get it all working. Get it all set up. We worked in 17. I'm good. I'm set. I'm ready. And then I do my final tests like uh, 30 minutes before totality. And OK, don't touch it because it all works. I run through it for the 12th time to make sure the program works right. And there I am. I'm in totality starts. And I'm looking at my computer screen. And um, I'm watching it. I'm watching the program run. And I do not hear my camera going. And at first, I'm thinking, well, this is my, you know, this is my test. I'm thinking, well, um, I must have not heard it. So then the next touch shot, which is probably a couple of minutes before totality or something, I don't hear the camera. I realize the program is running, but the camera is not responding. And then I'm watching the screen start to take, go through the program to take pictures rapidly. As totality is approaching, I can see the screen becoming brighter and brighter as the surroundings are becoming darker and darker. I can see it going through the sequences, and I hear nothing from my camera. All I hear is the woos and ahs from everyone around. This uh, is when panic starts to set in. So I look at this, I'm thinking, well, do we reboot? No, reboot, I know that takes uh, like two minutes, which is like the time of the eclipse. And uh, I reset the program. I may have tried that once or something. So I did this. I fooled around. Totality is well underway. Folks are just going out of their minds. And here I am going out of my mind. <laughs> so I did this, though, maybe fortunately after enough of these not so experiences. I did this for like 30 seconds of fooling around. And then I went to my backup plan, which I had learned I needed. And that was uh, basically get the other uh, camera, which is going to do the uh, spectra, spectra, forget that, and go to the uh, Eclipse one. And I had the manual one. So it was the manual settings, just like I used back in the day in Ghana. And going through the exposures, which I had written down what they should be, or I memorized them, I can't remember which, but I was doing them. And actually, I got good photographs. It, they're, as, they're blurry, but others from that same location are too. But that was a very low in the sky eclipse. So um, basically, it did work, but it wasn't, but it wasn't. No, it was not comfortable. So, okay, so uh, where are we at here? Um, so, yeah, so that's the story. So here's some eclipse photography, some suggestions. As always, you have to remember the eye safety. And, you know, if you're with pe people and you're around people, you have to remind them. If you have a finder scope, you have to think of what to do with it. You know, there are young folks around, you know, uh, as you know, but eclipse time, there's a lot of excitement. So you have to revisit that idea.
but I'd say you have to consider carefully whether you want to do this if this is your first eclipse. If you've done, you know, a couple, then yeah, you may be ready to move on like me, but you have to think about this. And here's where I would suggest, though, if you're going to try it, you can try photographing it or fiddling with the outer exposures and everything. But I'd say, you know, make up your mind to do it for just a portion of the time. So like I was doing with those students initially, you know, this time the eclipse might be four minutes if you're in the right part of the shadow. So you might say, okay, two minutes and then set your watch. And when the watch goes off, then you switch to either doing photographs or to enjoying it, one or the other. But I'd say you should, you know, if it's I'm, I'd say you should do that and make sure you enjoy it and then go for, you, you know, if you set it up to be automatic, you know, you can do that and work with that, but I'd say fiddle with it for two minutes, but then if, it, if it's not working, just enjoy it. And I, I'd say, uh, you know, uh, set a backup plan. And I'll say that my procedures and equipment are from decades ago. So, you know, that can change and there are different things. And so this could be dated in that way. But either way, you have to practice, practice, practice. And I do want to add one more thing about this, uh, about these dismal failures like my Ghanaian one and, and you know, this uh, near disaster in Chile. Yeah, it happened to me, but I'm not the only one. I remember the one in uh, Guadalupe, one of our colleagues, um, George, this is uh, Ken Phillips, actually. They had, you know, a big experiment they were planning and it was all set up and then they had a power failure. I mean, I don't know if it was local or the island wide or their own, but it just failed at totality time. And so they got nothing. And uh, Ken Phillips, who's a quite friendly guy normally, he was just, he was just quiet. So I don't know if he was uh, dejected or, or just angry, but <laughs> you, you, you know, this, this is, um, it's amazing. It, Eclipses, see, they know, they know what's happening. And so they, the, or the equipment knows that the eclipse is happening. And then another fellow, this is David Williams, uh, uh, George, but um, he was in Zimbabwe and he was uh, on a roof and they had all things planned out and, and everything. Well, during totality, a lot of the folks around got excited and started jumping around. And so, and the roof is vibrating. So uh, he had his backup plan. He said, okay, well, you might as well just enjoy it because I'm not going to get any good data. So th this happens. So if you're going to do it, I'd say use caution. Okay, I think I'll say that, well, you know, I do do nighttime astronomy. I, I actually like uh, uh, lunar eclipses too. Uh, and uh, this is one from Huntsville near, it was Totality wasn't in Huntsville, but this is near totality uh, at moonset. And this is a post-totality one in um, Boulder, Colorado. Uh, but uh, this has a nicer aspect to the mountains than our Huntsville one did. Um, and then this isn't like the wonderful Saturn one we saw earlier, but uh, this is a C11. And this is a... Uh, NGC 2 by 3 So my nighttime one, which is my real hobby for enjoyment, I don't do so, except for the eclipses, I don't do the sun because it, it would just be overwhelming and I'd be doing work and trying to compare it. So no, that that's that I don't do for my pleasure. That's nervousness. This, I don't try and measure anything. I don't want to know variable star, vari I, I want to just get pictures. Uh, that's what I want. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, awesome experiences. It's, uh, it's strange what can happen <laughs> when you don't want it to go that way. I mean, uh, I, uh, I know we're running a little late, but my only, my one bad experience was with an old film camera where the, the, the lead on the film slipped off the sprocket which of course I didn't know about you know, until I got home. 
So all kinds of crazy things. Uh, practice, 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 and uh, yeah. See, the eclipse knows, even though you don't. The eclipse, uh, the or the camera knew yeah. that there was an eclipse, even if you didn't I, know it would do that. I think the backup plan makes a lot of sense. Maybe there, maybe your primary is going to fail. Um, any questions from, uh, I guess, in the room here? Um, yes, sir. And I'll repeat it because I think. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, hang on one second. Um, yeah, I think you probably have to do that. Yeah, hang on one second. Yeah, cool. I don't want to mess it up for you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. I guess my question is, I'm um, I'm Dan. Is you did a an A star composite of the totality? Should the corona be some kind of hint of green, given the, I guess, the ionized gas of iron, or should it be white, shooting from say a stock? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, no, it should be white. Um, that green comes because actually remember again you're separating out the um the uh the components of the of the corona in that case so that is a particular spectral line at a particular location but before it's dispersed out like it's coming through a spectrum the light is all together and, and when it's all together it makes a, a white light so it's a white light basically um and uh so that's only one component of it and actually, um, I, I think, in fact, um, that green line probably comes from a different component that you're seeing for the main part. Uh, that kind of gets into more details about the about what they're different kind of coronas and stuff. Uh, but uh, the part that we see during the eclipse is a white a white one. It's like the scattering off of the dust in the corona and in, in the corona, the photospheric light, like scatters often comes to us that green light is from a like a, a different component of the light of the of the so nice thanks dan appreciate the question anyone else here um mm -hmm. a couple of folks had to had to bail out a little bit earlier now how about online i looked through chats i didn't see any direct questions there, there's a guy looks like he has one but yeah i had a couple questions sure. uh, for the 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 little filter thing you put over the finders did you like put, punch a little tiny pinhole in the middle no 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 pinholes that is just uh it's also uh i think from thousand notes and uh other places they have filters you can get that are the hard filters but they also have the film and so this is a film oh. that's used a lot in the um you know like in the eclipse glasses and things so it's just a film so I, I just bought uh, some, you know, a couple of sheets of that, and I cut out uh, enough of it, and just used real advanced uh, techniques like, like masking taping it to the, you know, to or some, rubber bands. Yeah. Okay. I thought yeah, you were so, trying to do like a, a pinhole thing like they have on the uh, Solar Max H Alpha things. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, there are different ways to do it. Uh, right. I'd say, you know, experiment uh, during the, you know, sunny time to see what works for you. Right. Now, my second question is, by definition, I mean, eclipses only happen rarely. How the heck do you practice taking something that only occurs, like, you know, that you can only afford to go to every three years? And it's, yeah. the conditions are so different then than they are any other time. Yeah, you're right. Well, you know, I'm planning to go to the angular eclipse for that purpose, actually, to practice. And that, that's one thing. It still isn't the same, but it helps. Oh. But, but you can practice other things because you know the time of it. You know the duration. And if you're using some of the software or something, uh, then you can, uh, you, you know, you can set it to do practice runs. And even if not, even if you're going to do the most simple thing, you have a dot watch or something that you can set for two minutes, 20 seconds, whether the, the duration is, have your own countdown and make sure your other like family members don't see you because they'll be talking about you for a while. But, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, and, and just do it for that 
the, that time and say that, okay, um, you know, we're going to go through these exposures in this sequence, um, and then you're going to pretend that you're bumped at some point, and well, can you refine the sun? Or do you have to like give up at that because you can't find it at all in that sort of a, uh, you know, uh, uh, time frame? Uh, you know, uh, maybe you can find that, you know, uh, you only have one axis that's a little bit free, so you can find that you can just uh, move it, you know, slew on one axis. You can find out which one. So that sort of thing you can you can practice, um, and and like like. You know, especially when I was doing it manually and going through the uh, the exposures. Another thing is, you know, there are all these little things you need. You need the uh, filter. You need the uh, the canopy to go over the uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, screen of the uh, of the PC if you're using that. Are you sure you're going to remember that? If you say, "Oh, the eclipse," I'm going to need this on my list. Well. If you practice it, you're going to say, well, oh, yeah, I'm trying to look at the screen. Oh, it's so bloody bright. And then you say, oh, I need this. You know, or it's hot, or there are mosquitoes, or I'm getting sunburned. Oh, I need sun temp. You know, these are things that you can find out. And and just like uh, as I was doing in my first time in Ghana and trying to set up the mount and get the access locked, even if it's automated or what, you know, are you going to get the uh, sequence right under pressure? Are you familiar enough with your equipment to do that? So that's another reason to practice. Okay. Yeah, good questions, Guy. Thanks. Um, anyone else online? Yeah. Uh, uh, corona chromosphere visible during an angular eclipse? Uh, no, the corona, corona is not, and the chromosphere is not. Now, if you use hydrogen alpha filter, the chromosphere is always visible because the uh, the uh, uh, hydrogen alpha line really comes from the chromosphere. So uh, if you do that, then you would really be seeing the chromosphere. So uh, you can do that. Uh, Hello. So Pamela is telling about these options. And you know, um, I found years ago something that I had you mentioned, uh, whatever that was, uh, you know, from uh, uh, Xavier. And uh, and again, you know, it ain't broke kind of thing is sort of the thing. Um, actually, it was broken in Chile, so you might try something different. But uh, the thing is, yes, I'd say learn something and um, and and go with that and and maybe it, it's very possible that uh, these folks found out that I was having this sort of trouble. Actually, I figured out in, in Chile what happened there. You know, I was connected to two cameras, and one of the camera connections was uh, loose. And I found out that that ruins uh, everything. So it just it, that's just the way it is, you know. So uh, you know, lots of you know, not moving parts, but lots of parts to work. You know, trying to do too many things can kind of opens you up too. Have you? I ever think we'll used... call it. Uh, I'm sorry, James. Uh... Have you ever used any of the trackers like the Ioptron Skyguider Pro? And do you have any specific advice for the upcoming annular eclipse? Well, uh, uh, no, I haven't used those. I don't do that. Uh, uh, I'm in a bold school equatorial amount of tracking uh, but uh uh you know i i i have i am not going to make any comment that may be the way to go and that may be what works uh you know that may be a far superior way uh so i don't want to comment on, on that but uh, for the angular eclipse um i think i mentioned that i said that in this case um and going back to another question yeah there the conditions are not so different from uh, from what you would get just on a normal day. So in this case, you can practice a lot. So this is an excellent example of using your Ioptron to try the setup and see if you can get it to work. Just on a normal sunny day, you set the time, you set you know about the same altitude for the eclipse as the eclipse or something, and you uh, you know do it to 
find the sun, track the sun, see if you can get it working. And um, uh, and then during the angular eclipse, kind of the camera settings will not be too far different, except again, that caveat for the day of event, because again, uh, the you know, the clouds understand that there's an eclipse and so they're going to plan to try and ruin your life. So uh, uh, that's another reason to, you know, so that you kind of have to work around, but otherwise it's going to be very similar. All right, I think we'll call it. Thank you so much, Alphonse. Uh, terrific rundown of your experiences that we can all take something from. And uh, we do have a special interest group. I know Pamela has, has chatted some things about that. So for folks online, you can uh, you can join our special interest group and and get some more insights on you know particulars that you might be wondering about. So, uh, Alphonse, thank you again for uh, your time tonight, and. Uh, you know, congratulations for George uh, eight years ago, but still terrific uh, for the Hale Award. So um, that's it for tonight. Uh, just for Novak members, I know it's getting late, but uh, uh, help us out on the field. We'll see you at uh, Sky Meadows next Saturday. And, and of course, uh, all hands on deck for Stargaze. So uh, thanks, Alphonse, and we'll, we'll sign off. OK, thank you very much. It was fun. Great job. Cheers. Hey, thanks.